Whoa, 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 calm down. Hey guys, how's it going? My name is Thomas Brush. I'm the creator of a game called Pinstripe. Also a game called Never Song that's coming out May 20th. Please consider wishlisting on Steam. That would really mean a lot to me. Click the link below. I'm trying to hit 50,000 wishlists. We currently have like 20,000, so it'd be awesome if you guys could wishlist. Today, I'm actually gonna play uh, more of my game Never Song. This is actually episode two, so if you wanna see episode one, click below. And today we're gonna focus on three tools that I use to make this game, three specific tools. So let's go ahead and jump into Unity and play my Steam game, Never Song. We're gonna rip it up and you guys can hopefully see behind the curtain how I made this game. And we're gonna do more episodes later, so keep an eye open, but let's just jump into Unity. All right, I can't talk today, but that's okay, bye. <laughs> so I really wanted to show you guys actually, um, Welcome back, by the way. Uh, I wanted to show you guys quickly not only what this scene looks like inside of Unity, but what it looks like in, in Photoshop. So again, as you can see, if we exit the, um, the play mode and actually run to, let's see here, it's called scene, there it is, frame eight. We double click on frame eight and then double click on the actual scene itself. You can see that everything's sort of layered. It's kind of hard to see with the vignette going on. Um, but I really wanted to open up these uh, various layers inside of Photoshop. So this is what it looks like inside of Photoshop, this scene here. And as you can see, there's a little stand-in character here just to help me understand the scale of this Photoshop image. It's really, really important when you're working on art in your game, whether you're in Blender or whatever, to have a scaled object that is, I guess, the relative size of the, your player so that you get a good un understanding of what things um, are supposed to be scaled at. So that's an old version of Pete. Um, so we can disable him. We don't need him for now. And as you can see, everything's layered um, just like you see in the actual scene. There's a little bit of, uh, of differences of positions of various objects. But I can edit this pillar if I wanted to and just double click it. And you can see that it's a smart object and I can edit how it looks inside of here, save it out, and then the changes will be um, inside of the actual pillar. So an example of this is if I double clicked on this and wanted to put a graffiti heart um, on this pillar, what I would do is I would just, let's say big old pink heart right here. Let's do a big graffiti heart right here. Save it out. <laughs> There it is. What I would do is export this as a PNG and we could call this pillar mid left. Let's call it heart just because I don't want to screw up my game, especially when it's being launched in a week. <laughs> so let's go to our actual pillar here. I think it's this one. So there's our pillar and you can see our heart got imported. We can drag that in and you want to make sure that you set the scale pixels per unit properly for this. So it's just 180 is the number Eric and I decided to use. Hit apply. And now you can see in game view, we have our little heart uh, pillar right there. Now, what I wanted to explain really quick is as you can see, it's the coloring is very different um, from what you see inside of Photoshop. Everything's pretty blue here. So one of the things that I actually did was last year when we blew out the budget and we knew we had to get this game done as quickly as possible, I scrambled because I did not like the color scheme of this. A lot of you are thinking, Thomas, this is a really cool color scheme. I do agree, like the green and blue looks awesome. I love it. And this is what it was from day one. But towards the end there, I realized this does not match the rest of the game. The rest of the game looks like late summer, like the sun burned the game. I wanted it to look uh, vignetted and sepia. And so what I ended up doing was instead of actually editing the Photoshop files, I scrambled as quick as I could and would open up the individual PNGs that I had exported from the PSDs and quickly did a hue shift of every single thing that had green. So I literally just changed the green portions of the various PNGs and gave it this warm burned orange look. And I really liked it. And it looked great with some of the blue, so I had little pops of blue in there just to give it a little difference um, from other levels, because there's a lot of levels that are orange and yellow. And then the final thing here that I did was I actually created a vignette 
that follows the player around. And that vignette also includes an orange bloom. So there's a bloom of orange that follows the player at all times. So if I disable that vignette here, there it is. This one, there's, you can see there's several, but there's one that's activated. That's the one we're actually looking at. So as you can see, if I move it, you can see it's one giant, here, let me show you. If I zoom out like this, this is what it looks like. It's just a giant, ugly square that follows the player. And if I go back into play mode, it's gonna snap right back into place. <laughs> just kidding. Um, let's see if I can uh, go over here. Okay, good. All right, it snaps back into place. So here's what it looks like with it off. So as you can see, it's totally different. And it's just a quick change um, that I made last minute. I said, you know what? I need a vignette. Boop. And there you go. It changes the whole look of the game. The best thing you can do for your indie game is create some kind of fog or vignette or use low lighting. This is why horror movies are so popular with low budget studios because they have a very, uh, compared to the rest of the film industry, they have a very low budget because you can get away with a lot of mistakes with low lighting. Great observation, Simeon. Whoa, 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 calm down. Yeah, let's save it out. Gracias. All the enemies respond. Okay, so what I need to do is I need to go up higher. These are elevators were the very first mechanic of the game that Eric and I came up with. So they're just a little bit different than a standard platforming elevator in the sense that you have to jump down twice and it'll it'll sort of activate it. And then when you whack the handle, it releases. I honestly wish all elevator all ugh, can't talk. <laughs> I honestly wish all elevators were like this in real life. Let's break those pumpkins. Get out of here. I don't want that. And whack this. Get the water to drop down. Ooh. Mm. And I would love to actually go into scene view and hopefully you guys can watch what's happening here in scene view. Let's see, let's go to frame. There we go. Okay, so as I play, watch what happens to the camera as we move. Oh no. He's gonna get washed off. Oh, we're good. So that was a bug. I don't know why that happened, but I'm gonna trust we're okay. Oh my goodness. Oh no, we're in a glitch. Okay, let's let's see what we can do here. Like I said, glitches are gonna happen in play mode in the editor and it's they're not gonna happen in, in the actual Steam version because I'm messing with stuff. So I gotta be really careful here. Let's disable the enemy gates here. Okay, we're good. Help! Help! Yeah. Things are triggering that when they shouldn't. <laughs> good grief. Ugh, what's going on? Everything's breaking. I think we're okay. <laughs> I think we're okay. You got sludge smeared all over my jeans. Sorry, man. Your peach fuzz, your story. You owe me a list okay. of favors. What's your problem? You. My problem is you. I've tried to be nice to you, but my patience is running thin. I'm done with you. <laughs> Let's be friends. Really? Okay, sure. Let's be friends. Can I be your best man at Ren's funeral? <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. All right, let's kill these bugs, and then I want to show you how the various uh, lines of dialogue are being, I guess, managed inside of Unity. So the three tools used to make this game. <laughs> Sorry, Simeon. The three tools used in the creation of this game um, there were there were several, more than three, um, but the main three was Photoshop, which I just showed you, Spine, which I'm going to show you in a bit, and then Unity, which is obviously the tool that I'm using right now. So when it comes to Unity, managing files, this is about as good as it can get. I, I mean, I could be wrong, but it's, it's going to feel messy. It's going to feel crazy. 
One of the organization techniques we've done though is we've actually put our sounds all into giant folders. So I have effects here. These are all of my effects. Um, I have my screams. And let's see here. I have boss sound effects, coma card sound effects, enemy sounds. Things got a little messy towards the end. Once you once you scramble to get your game done, things can get really messy. So yeah, these are various voice acting lines. So for example, we had a conversation with Gomboisa earlier. Um, so you have all of Gomboisa's um, lines. Try to help, honest. But well, I already told John I'd help. I <laughs> ah, just kidding. Um, yeah. So we have all of our voice acting lines inside of one folder and we're referencing those based on which dialogue we're actually looking at, which line of dialogue we're actually looking at. Okay. So let's go ahead and get everything quickly beaten so that I can show you the boss. Let's make our way down. I'll play a little bit. Stop talking. I love hitting levers. It's always really fun for me. Who are you? Pete. Hey, Pete. It's me, Gom Toddler. <laughs> Hello. Game of hide and seek with my big bro, Gom Boysa. Oh? You seen him around? Yes, actually. He was swinging on the tree upstairs. Where's the app for app? <laughs> uh, swinging in the field. I didn't think he was actually playing hide and seek. Yeah, I don't know, man. Wish I could beat his butt. I am sick of him tricking me. I can never reach him though on those eggs. Maybe if I had that bat though. Did you know that you can swing upwards with your bat and go a little bit higher than normal? Yes, I did. Of course you did. That's why they call you the slug. It's also because I'm the creator of this game. Okay, so. By the way, that voice actor or actress was um, Tiffany Grant. She did the voices for Gomboisa as well. So she does all of the Gomboisa family. Gom Toddler, Gomboisa, and Gom Girlsa. <laughs> Wonderful names, I know. She, uh, she did the voices for all of those characters. And she did a really good job. So a lot of, a lot of this was added towards the end. Um, showing the actual sent sent a spider body traversing in various locations through this level was really important to me um and i added that last minute get out of there don't hurt my friend even though he's not very friendly and these pulsing sacks and um sacks of eggs here that's a word you want to hear every day pulsing sack they were added last minute as well, as were these waterfalls. So this level was probably the most boring level of all of them. And I'm not very good at interior levels. I've never been good at that. Um, I'm really... Probably my forte is exteriors. Um, landscapes, rolling hills. And uh, this level was just difficult to, to get right. Who is that? Who are you? <gasps> that doctor smile he's holding my girlfriend get out of here what again guys I'm acting surprised I know what's going on I've played this game a thousand times <laughs> so these um, various um, breakable objects here are just prefabs so they're prefabs I use over and over and over again and they all contain the same script okay um, let's see if I can zoom into one of them here. Let's see if we can select it. <laughs> There's so much going on, it's hard to select things at this point in the game's creation. Let's see, they're all lined up on one layer, eh? Hmm. Let's see if I can type it in. Skull. There we go. So this is a prefab here. Um, there it is. That one's gone. Where did you go? Where did you go? So this is a skull. It's just a PNG image. And inside of it, it has a hit pool with some hit particles. Um, and it also 
contains obviously a sound effect, a break sound. And these, everything you can break in the game all uses one script and it's a breakable script. And it has all these different variables to make it different. So you can break pots, you can break boxes, skulls, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they also inherit some, some physics, custom physics properties um, from the physics object that Eric created as well. And there's also a death sound here. Um, I don't know if you can see that, there you go. Death sound here and various velocities. So as you can see, there's a lot of scripts that we use in this game, but they are very basic and very generic so that they can be used across a lot of different objects. If it was the old me, um, and Eric has really helped me grow as a developer just in observing how he writes his scripts. If it was the old me, let's say in Pinstripe, I would have called this script skull.c sharp. That's really foolish because the skull isn't really a skull. It's just a breakable object. So you really should be calling it breakable.c sharp. Let's move on. Thomas, how do you know where you're going? How do you think? What is this? Thingy. Is it wearing an apron? <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. All right, let's drop down here and take a look at what's in this little channel. Believe it or not, the camera moving to various locations um, to pinpoint where things were opening and what what was occurring during those kind of paused cutscenes. That script was added way towards the end of the development. So a lot of times, what would happen? <coughs> is doors would open and the camera wouldn't move. And players were like, what just opened? So it's the subtle things like that that are really important for a game. And honestly, they can cause the game to get a terrible review. Um, I know with Pinstripe, there were several bugs and glitches that would cause the game to get a zero star score just because of one little thing. And so the problem with story-driven games, as opposed to, you know, big multiplayer games or, um, some sandbox games or walking simulators is that with story based games like this, if there's I'm talking, I'm talking. Let me finish what I was saying, Simeon. The problem with story based games is if you make one mistake like that, where the camera doesn't pivot and show what actually happened, players can get really confused and it slowly can build up and they can just rage quit the game because they don't understand what's going on. Um, and you can kind of get away with that kind of stuff in these bigger sandbox games that are more about gameplay and fun and being creative as opposed to following a cohesive story. So I think story games are actually, and this is just because I'm, I guess, a narcissist, but <laughs> story based games really do require a lot of effort um, and they require, I think, honestly, they just require a bigger budget. Uh, than if this game was just a playful sandbox game or a puzzle game. Um, anyway. That's my voice, by the way. Alright, so before we get started on the boss fight, let's just first, let's open up the snake. So originally this was called Snakehead. So you'll notice that a lot of my characters have completely different names in the actual editor than they have in the game. It's not until towards the end of the game's development where I start solidifying all the characters' names. So right, uh, right at the beginning of the game's development, it was called Snakehead. So let's open up Snakehead in Spine. So we have our output folder with all of our data that we exported from Spine. And then we also have a project files folder with all of our project files. Let's just double click on Snakehead, and this is gonna open up Spine 2D. Spine 2D has a lot of features that the new Unity uh, 2D animation tools, which you can find in the package manager, have. So personally, I think Spine 2D, I prefer it, um, just because, you know, it, it's got a lot of cool features that I'm used to. But you could accomplish the same thing now in Unity's new tools. Yeah, 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 I get it. That's disgusting, Thomas. Why on earth? Why is it? <laughs> Maybe I should get my editor to cut this out. How about we do this? Is that better? Um, <laughs> I swear, I swear, I, I literally swear on everything holy. 
it wasn't really my intention to make it look like that. It's just how it all worked out. Okay, so... <laughs> So, moving on, let's see here. Skin phase zero, and we can slowly click on the various phases here. And as you, as you can see, when we play this boss, it slowly disintegrates and breaks apart. So we have all these different skins that we can handle, and that's actually one of the reasons why I like Spine 2D, um, is you can have all these different skins here. We have all these skins here and all these different PNGs associated, associated with each bone. So the legs wiggle simply by wiggling the bone. See that? They pivot at that point there. Um, the pulsing, let's see here. These things can pulse by shifting the scale. And so if we go to animation mode, you can see that this is the uh, pounding animation. And so here are all of our animations. Let's see here, where are they? This is a long list here. We have the awake so that just played and then awake loop this is playing right now so let's just keep that playing while we actually play the game so there's the awake loop i can show you all of the various keyframes here here are the keyframes for the loop every little piece is being animated and wiggling it looks complicated but actually what ended up happening was i would just move every single leg rotate them all at the same time keyframe it and then I would shift all of the different keyframes so it looks like they're wiggling so I could do this with my hand see and that's that's like only really three keyframes and I just duplicate them all for every finger and then I just shift them so it makes it look like it's wiggling same thing is true with our phallic snake so here we go let's jump back into play mode so you can see she's wiggling Let's jump into play mode here, and I will show you the animations as we play the boss. So, Simeon just disabled. He's no longer in the scene. He's actually now part of the snake head animation. Let's see here, where is it? Eat. Go to eat, there it is. So this is our eat animation, see that? So now Simeon is part of the animation. There we go. There he is. So we are literally right here. So let's get playing the boss here. Now all of the sounds in the spine, uh, in the inside of Unity are actually handled with spine. Okay, so this is a particle emitter. So these are not actually being animated. That's a particle emitter. Let me show you how the sound is handled really quickly here. And some of you pro probably already know how this is done if you've seen my live, live streams or previous videos. But just really quickly here, the scream, where is it? Sing, it's called sing, not scream. So this is what it looks like in the actual spine animation window. And you can see all of these, see those um, words appearing on the screen? Those are actually called events. So those words obviously are not gonna be seen in the Unity editor, but they're heard by the Unity editor. And what I mean is this string called emit particles three is sent to Unity and we can tell Unity to listen for it with a script. So if string equals emit particles three, then it's going to emit particles three, which we define in the Unity Inspector, and it will emit the particles. Now, it's also true that it's going to be playing a certain sound. So this sound effect, play sound one, actually it's play sound 14. There's 14 sounds you can play. I think it's total of 14. This sound effect is immediately gonna play. There it goes, play sound 14. That's gonna play, and so that's that screaming sound. Boom. All right, let's play this boss. <clears throat> Come on. Pound the ground, buddy. There we go.
Hello. Whoa! Get over here. I'm like a master at defeating these bosses now. So again, the music was written in Logic Pro. So the three main tools that I use to make games are Unity, Photoshop, and Spine. Um, but I also use some other tools as well, like Logic Pro um, to write my music and Audacity to mix and edit sound effects. And obviously Visual Studio. There we go. Visual Studio to actually uh, write the C-sharp scripts. Again, 90% of the scripts were written by Eric Coburn, who was the developer of the game, the, the coder of the game. And then I did everything else. Oh, sh Get your butt. There we go. Uh! Alright. One more scream. Before we get that final scream, I want to do something that's pretty fun here. We're going to go to Snakehead here, and we're going to go to the Output folder. And what I want to do is actually be able to change some of the graphics. What you can do is actually open up the Snakehead PNG Atlas that is generated from Spine. And if you wanted to, you could, you could change whatever you wanted. You could actually turn the snake, you know, a rainbow. Let's actually just Google. Let's do this, actually. Let's just color in some rainbow colors. So this is not the best way to edit your spine uh, illustration. What you would actually do is you would go into um, the actual Photoshop file, the original Photoshop file, change the graphics there, which that's a bunch of different layers, probably 30 different layers of all of these different pieces in Photoshop, export those, bring them into spine, and then export those out inside of unity i don't want to do that right now because that's going to break the game but what we can <laughs> what we can do is just save out this snakehead png don't worry everything is stored somewhere on github so all the changes we make here we can go back in time it's okay don't worry about it all right let's see what happens here <gasps> it's completely broken it's a mess <laughs> so we can edit the actual images at runtime if we want to. So as you can see guys, the game isn't that beautiful, obviously, if the graphics aren't beautiful. That's like the most obvious statement I've ever made in my life. But it is true. All right. So we killed Snakehead, which her name is Mrs. Richardson, actually. You learned a new song. Yay! Okay. Spiderian Overture. So we learned a new song, screamed from the lengthy esophagus of Mrs. Richardson. Well, thank you very much, Mrs. Richardson, for screaming at me a new song. Dude, I'm so confused. Yeah. Now that I'm thinking about it, I heard Gumboisa talking about this a week ago. Looks like the grown-ups are turning into monsters. That can't be. Ooh. Anyways, Gumboisa mentioned finding three sleeping monsters. I hate to say it, but I think we need to wake them up to find Red. They apparently know how to sing. That's right. One down, two to go. Quick, let's go play that song we learned on Red's piano. <clears throat> you got it, bird. Let's go. All right. So we just learned a new song and we totally ruined the artwork. Let's actually fix it really quick. <laughs> just, just to be sure. Let's go back in time, save it, just in case for some reason something actually gets pushed to source tree. Okay, we're good. All right. Let's make sure we save the game. Yeah. 
And head out. Ooh, what's that? Hello. Yikes. Is that Simeon? Oh no. Simeon's stuck in her esophagus. So this was actually one of the big challenges of the game when we were creating it is, is the journey back to the piano to learn to play a song, is that annoying? Um, and we haven't gotten any complaints so far in alpha testing or beta testing, so I think people enjoy that feeling of traversing back to a location, um, especially when they, they like the music and, and when it's a peaceful experience. So, yeah. So let's load into Redwind Field. And you can see a lot of stuff did not save. Man, everything's broken. <laughs> Simeon's back in the well, which is, I guess that's the way it's gotta be. Um, I think we'll be okay though. But I'm gonna finish up the rest of the game in future episodes.